I sit here, somewhat perplexed, with a gnawing feeling inside that something is wrong. I can't quite explain it, but it still eats me up inside. Sometimes you just know when something is wrong. Is it true? I don't make sense, let me explain. I just went to my wife's office to give her the phone she left at home. No, I didn't see any message from someone she's cheating with or anything like that. It is not so easy. One of her employees looked at me strangely, but did not make eye contact. It was like he was avoiding looking at me while still looking at me, if that makes sense. I don't know what it was, but his expression stuck in my memory. I think it was an expression of pity. Maybe I should start from the beginning to bring you up to speed, since I don't quite understand it myself. If I don't do this, none of this will really make sense. I promise to be brief. My wife Denise and I met at university on the East Coast in the early 90s. My name is Joel. I'm 40 and she's 41. We've lived on the West Coast for 17 years. We've been married 17 years, but have been together since I was 19. We got married when I was 23, so I've spent more than half my life with this woman. We were young, naive, full of hope. All the wonderful things that come with being young. We have two daughters, Gemma and Sophie. They are 12 and 10 years old. Denise is an architect and runs her own firm a few blocks from our house. I left that career 16 years ago for another, more lucrative one in computers and entertainment. We were in the middle of all this in the 90s in Silicon Valley. Well, let's just say everything turned out well for me. We are not rich, but we live very comfortably by American standards. It's funny how those big salaries don't really mean that much here in California with its high cost of living. With such literally poor schools and high taxes, you end up spending a lot of money on their education every year. I got distracted. We gave birth to our first daughter when I was 28. I knew nothing about parenting, but we made our way. I hope I didn't mess up as bad as my dad. We'll just have to wait and see. Denise worked for many years in large firms. She was a great designer and still is. We've said many times that I'd be happy to take time off when we have kids and not leave it solely her responsibility. Funny how that doesn't work so well when you're making 90% of your family's income. You become a slave to the responsibility of providing for your new household. I envied her freedom, she envied my career. After about five years of this and the birth of our second daughter, we decided our house was too small, so we built a bigger one. Soon after, financial circumstances required Tracy to return to work to help with expenses. After a short time in the workplace where she was constantly unhappy about having to work for others, I encouraged her to start her own business. Little did I know that this would be the most worrying decision I had ever made in my life to that point. I also didn't know that it could have a very big impact on the outcome of our seemingly inevitable divorce. I'm a jealous person. Always been like this. This is due to some self-doubt. Why am I not confident in myself? Mainly because of my father. Watching your siblings be physically and verbally abused has such an impact on your psyche. I blamed myself for not being good enough for him to love me. And I blamed my sister for making him angry all the time. My sister and I haven't spoken for years. I guess I always harbored resentment towards her, accusing her of destroying our family. It wasn't her fault, but it took me a quarter of my life to realize it. But that is another story. It took me six years of therapy to realize that at age eight, you simply couldn't protect your sister from a 200-pound man who took out his hatred of his mother on her every day. His mother was also very cruel to him. One of the few times I met my grandmother, she insulted my little brother for wearing women's shoes, and she called my sister insults because of her clothes. My brother was four years old, he was playing with his mother's slippers. My sister was eight, and this outfit my grandmother was talking about was her outfit for a dance recital, which hated women. So Denise started her own company. At first it was just her. Her partner suffered a nervous breakdown and we had to end that professional relationship. I called him and asked him what the hell he was doing. He stopped taking his medications, some serious antidepressants, and he stopped taking them without the help of a doctor. Some of these drugs should not be thrown off like that. He was barricaded in his apartment, trying not to kill himself. 
Of course, our professional relationship is over. You can't have an unstable business partner. Denise and I started having problems a few years after we got married. They started before she returned to work. I thought it was time to work through our problems, so I took us to counseling. We went to therapy together for five years as a couple. We went to therapy with a child therapist to learn how to communicate with our oldest daughter. We were both in individual therapy. She only lasted a year, but for me this is already the sixth year. I went to the doctor initially because of panic attacks. I stayed because I received an education in human psychology, which helped me in my career and in my home life. I've managed a lot of people at work. I became a very good listener. For example, one day my friend's mother, who lived in a nursing home, was unhappy with the food she was served. She was so unhappy that she threw her on the floor and called her trash every time my friend came to visit her. After I talked to him for a few minutes, I learned that his mother was an excellent cook when he was a child. I thought about it and suggested that perhaps she was angry because she could no longer take care of herself the way she used to take care of him. Perhaps she was angry because she used to cook these wonderful dishes for children, but now she physically could not do it. Perhaps it was even humiliating for her that her son saw her in such a state. I'd be angry too. I suggested that the next time he came over and she started getting angry, I would remind her of all the meals she cooked for their family, talk to her about how they sat at the dinner table as a family and remember all the happy moments that he can remember, thank her for what she did for their family, telling her that, of course those nursing home meals would never compare to what she cooked for their family. He did just that. I wasn't trying to be a therapist, I'm not qualified to be one, but as a manager, it becomes part of the daily responsibilities. And you know what? I was right and immediately hit the nail on the head. He just kept reminding his mother of her culinary talents every time he visited her. I would never have been able to give this advice without getting some insight from my doctor. I had anxiety attacks after my father died. He died from complications caused by a heart attack at the age of 63. My anxiety, Something about all those repressed emotions that came out when it became safe to express them. I carried this shit inside of me for over 20 years, and it all just came out. My wife had to clean up a lot of the mess I made. I loved her for this. I was grateful that she was there and supported me. I started taking antidepressants, mainly to regulate my mood swings. Mainly to stop suicidal thoughts. They scared me the most. One day, I even just walked into an intersection without looking at the traffic. It was a busy intersection in downtown Berkeley, and I didn't cross it at a crosswalk or traffic light. I was hoping that a car would hit me. It would be an easy way out of my pain. Another time, I thought about how easy it would be to just jump off the Golden Gate Bridge on Father's Day while walking across it with my kids. It's strange but I am a very competent and successful person in my business. I manage 25 creative people, and on the outside I appear as hard as a rock. I successfully manage millions of dollars of intellectual property each year and am respected throughout the company. One of my co-workers once joked and asked why I had so many bright shirts and such. I responded in an email that the brighter the color of the shirt, the more internal trauma I was trying to hide that day. You see, people are easily distracted by your appearance and don't really see you. It was a funny but unfortunately honest answer. So there were problems in our marriage. My wife and I didn't have the connection I so desperately needed, but damn, I tried. I started working on this. Date nights, romantic notes, you know, all those things to win her back. Since she returned to work, I have taken over cooking for the family. I had previously taken several cooking classes and found it an easy and stress-relieving way to provide dinner for my family every night. It really was a lot of work, but it was worth it when they appreciated it. I also cook at our parties as it keeps me busy and limits the amount of time I have to spend talking to people. You see, I have been uncomfortable in my skin my entire life. Until recently, when I took my life into my own hands. Don't get me wrong, my wife and I have had many great times. Quite a lot, actually. We had amazing vacations, starting with our honeymoon. 
like those camping trips when the girls were younger or trips to Europe and Hawaii. We always found a way to reconnect as a family when it was most needed. We upped and moved across the country together right after college. We started our careers together, our lives, everything together. You can't live half your life with someone and not experience something amazing together. Like the first time I saw the lake we stayed at for our first anniversary. I knew then that one day we would buy a house there. Sixteen years later, it became a reality. Denise and I have always agreed on major life decisions. Decisions like building a house, moving across the country, changing careers, having children, buying a second home. It was actually scary what we could achieve together when we both agreed on one of these big goals. For example, when we found out we were having a baby, within a week we already had a house. When we talked about buying a second home, within a week we were at the closing stage. When we disagreed, it was a completely different matter. Neither of us grew up learning to fight honestly, and many damaging things were said on both sides. Denise also has many good qualities. She was a wonderful mother, lover, architect, and friend. Life just gets in the way sometimes. And sometimes you're just not strong enough to handle some of the challenges that growing up throws at you. Denise was stressed and overwhelmed all the time. She took on too many clients and promised them things she couldn't deliver. She promised unrealistic deadlines, low fees, and so on. As soon as one of the existing projects reached a dead end, she took on new work, usually with dissatisfaction either on the part of the client or on the part of the contractor. The moment a conflict arose, she took on a new job, most likely because the new relationship was enjoyable and her projects were easier to manage in the early stages. Of course, it was easier than sitting together and solving complex problems. This cycle did not stop. It was self-reinforcing because at the end of the projects, she usually won some kind of design prize and the clients were delighted with the results. I saw the problem, but that was enough justification for her to take on more and more work. I told her how proud I was of her and what a great example she was setting for the girls, hoping that she would feel some sense of achievement but it wasn't enough for her. Our home life has become complicated. I managed almost everything from home and still worked full time. I developed a routine. I did the shopping, cooked the food, did the laundry, pretty much everything. We agreed that I would do this to help her launch the company. I mean, she took five years off to have her kids and be with them. So what's three years of doing all the housework compared to that? but I couldn't get her to slow down and help at home to relieve me of some of the burden. We also stopped counseling two years ago to focus on the relationship and start dating again. Sometimes these dates really helped. She has always had nightmares, but recently they have become more frequent due to stress at work. By nightmares, I mean Denise would wake up screaming at me as if I were a stranger in the room trying to attack her. I had to do my best to calm her down mentally and emotionally. Then she fell asleep again. It took me several years to realize that she didn't remember any of this when it happened. I lay there feeling like I was going to have a heart attack, waking up from a deep sleep to her screaming at me. You tend to take it personally. Denise was clearly worried. Perhaps this was the cost of our modern busy lives with the unrealistic expectations we set for ourselves. It's sad if that's the case. Our sex life was practically non-existent for some years, once a month or so, and always on my initiative. We talked about the reasons. Medical, perhaps hormones. She claimed that the reason was that she did not feel close to me. She didn't want to have sex with someone she didn't love. She rejected me so many times that at some point I stopped trying. It's humiliating when your wife constantly rejects you. It hits your self-esteem. I tried to spice up our sex life. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. I tried to date her. I lost weight and got in shape. I focused on myself and my family, not her. It was too painful to continue seeking her approval. It was a constant pain. I decided at some point that I would probably divorce her after the girls left for college in a few years. I could hold out until then, right? She actually brought up this idea in couples therapy one day. It was definitely a great confidence booster. I deserved a chance with someone who truly loved me. 
but first I needed to start loving myself, so I tried to stop focusing on her and focus on myself. This was easier said than done. I started opening up at work, interact with people, listen, communicate. I think it was my way of not letting all the dysfunction at home destroy me emotionally. I was giving myself a chance to escape in the future. I told myself that I wouldn't have to endure this forever. I could leave. Or she could. Why didn't I just leave? I used to love her. The kind of needy love that wasn't helpful or healthy, and I didn't understand that until much later in our marriage. One woman at work, whose husband also worked there, became my partner in the department. She was the administrative one, and I was the creative director. She had been burned in a previous group with incompetent staff, so when we started working together, she was amazed at how well I managed everything. She constantly admired, and I mean admired, constantly admired how great I was doing everything and how in control I was. She admired how much she enjoyed working with me. I mean, comparing competence to incompetence is not a fair comparison. At some point, she started sharing personal information about her life and such. She was my work wife. We became good friends, but I knew she was crossing a line and I was uncomfortable, so I kept a barrier. She brought her husband twice to introduce me to him, and he avoided me as if I were contagious. He didn't look me in the eye. I didn't know what the hell was really going on. I later realized that if she admired me so much at work, she probably did the same with her husband in the evening. No wonder he felt awkward around me. I wouldn't appreciate it either if my wife came home and constantly talked about some guy at work and how wonderful he was. I would probably hate him a lot. Imagine my surprise when exactly this happened. A few months ago, things reached a critical point for Denise at work. The clients were angry. Denise was in a panic. Our home life was unimportant. It got to the point where Denise finally admitted that she was doing too much, and we started discussing why and how to fix it. We fired her business consultant. The advice was terrible. I started helping her structure her office. How to plan, who does what, job responsibilities, office equipment maintenance, all that stuff. I'm not a business expert, but I spent 17 years managing millions in manufacturing processes and personnel. It really wasn't that difficult for me. I took immediate action, and we saw immediate results. Denise finally relaxed for the first time in a long time, and we started having sex again. But it didn't last long. I arranged interviews. Jared was smart, bright, full of energy, and had some experience. He was eager to please. He started working only three days a week, which soon became four as it became clear that he was a reliable employee. I started noticing a few things within a month of hiring him. Small, harmless things. Denise came home and told me how wonderful he was. I listened. One weekend he made a gift for the office and gave it to her. She was so excited. She couldn't stop talking about him. Denise asked me if she should give him a thank you gift. I told her it was unprofessional since she was his boss, and a sincere thank you would be enough. Things went on like this for a while. I mean she kept talking about him. One morning she texted him at 7 a.m. saying she was taking him to a client meeting at 9 a.m. She invited him to breakfast. I thought it was strange. I know this because I read her message. I know I said at the beginning that I didn't see any messages about sex, and I didn't. It was just a strange message. She shouldn't have taken him to this meeting in the first place. Let me explain. It was a meeting with a potential client with whom she did not have a contract. Since he was a junior member of the office, he should not have been paid almost a full day of supervision. We said in her business plan that these things couldn't happen if she wanted to be profitable. Designers would design, and she would be the liaison with clients and the firm's creative leader. Secondly, this meeting invitation seemed like a last-minute thing. She didn't tell him anything about it days before, and suddenly at 7 a.m. she wants him to go with her. I know this because the day before she told me she was going alone. I know you think this all looks innocent. This is usually true. I spent a significant amount of time trying not to be a jealous husband and let things just take their course. One night in bed, I told her about women at work, who said they had attractions for others while married. 
I asked her if she had these since we started our relationship. I mean likes, not men. Of course she said no. I told her the story about my work wife and her husband's reaction to her blushing compliments about me all the time to other people. Denise said it was disrespectful to her husband, and it was no surprise that he acted distant towards me. Exactly. It seemed to me that Denise was attracted to the new employee. I could understand why. I don't think she even realized it. I think he reminded her of me at his age. Energetic, articulate, hopeful, dedicated, and hardworking. I'm not bragging, but these are the qualities that attracted her to me. She told me this when we got married. I won a student academic award for my thesis project at our university. I worked at renowned design firms and went on to work at a renowned entertainment studio, quickly moving up the ranks. I was a good match. I mean, this guy doesn't bring any baggage with him because he's not really real in her life. Like a fantasy. Not real in the sense that what attracted her to him was an illusion. She didn't have to argue with him or deal with kids or feel guilty for not helping around the house or feel like a bad mother to him. So in her mind, he was perfect and I was not. On the outside, she had a seemingly perfect life. Two houses, no debts, my own hobby business, a family with a dog, beautiful healthy children, a successful and charming husband. Yes, sure. People only see what they want to see. It's like the bright shirt example I mentioned earlier. People don't see me because they are distracted by my bright clothes. And all those successful life traits I just mentioned. They blinded all of our friends and family to the fact that we were a struggling couple trying to cope with everyday stresses and significant baggage from our childhoods just like everyone else. They would never have believed that we were actually close to divorce a few years ago. That's why we stopped couples therapy. She ruined our marriage. There are only so many things from the past that you can look at, especially if you have such a character that you cannot forgive, like my wife. Every week we pulled out all the problems from the first 10 years of marriage. We pulled it all out on the table and my wife was seething with anger. It didn't matter if it happened 15 years ago. Negative energy was destroying us. We have just returned from a wonderful holiday in Europe as a family and were incredibly happy. This trip gave me some of the best memories of my life. Then we went to our weekly therapy and came out on the verge of divorce. I fired my therapist. I told my wife I wanted to use the money on our dates and reconnected instead. And we did it. For a while. A little attraction to others is good, I think. Playful conversation, friendship. As long as it doesn't cross the line, I have quite a lot of girlfriends at work. I keep this in perspective. I don't go out with them alone outside of the office. We dine in the company's public areas. We don't have closed door conversations. These friendships greatly helped my self-esteem when my wife rejected me. I felt admired and respected by these friends at work. I realize that people still find me attractive and desirable, even if my wife doesn't. I recently installed a security system in Denise's office, a simple program that allows you to see activity from another station via a webcam. You can write it down or not. I mentioned to my wife that I installed this in the office since she has a lot of new employees now and I was worried about our expensive equipment. A couple of days ago, I opened this program at home to do some maintenance and noticed that my wife was still working there. I thought she left for a meeting. Her friend also came and they talked. They were the only ones in the office. The security system had an audio feed, so I decided to listen for a minute. For some time my wife and her friend talked about life, work, ordinary things. Her friend Annie had been married for some time and talked about some of the difficulties they were facing. Common family problems. She wanted children, but her husband did not. He avoided sex with her, so she went to therapy. They were good friends, so this level of conversation was normal. Annie asked Denise about our family life, how we were doing, how we managed to be together for so long. Denise's answer was a little more honest than I was comfortable with. At least it woke me up to the truth of what was really going on. I don't know, really, I mean, most of our marriage was just learning how to be married, if that makes sense. Denise said, it was complicated. Of course we fought, 
and we went to therapy together. And Elliot has a lot of baggage from his childhood. It's like I had a damaged husband, and I sometimes get angry at what I was put through with his unstable emotional state when his father died. You love him, I mean, really love. Like if you could start over, would you choose him again? I mean, he's good looking, seems like a great dad and all that. I always thought you two were happy, Annie asked. I loved him. I think I'm more attached to him now than I love him. If I had to start over, I don't think I would choose him. But then I wouldn't have my daughters. You know, I somehow cheated on Tom. This was hard. I mean, I didn't really cheat. He just didn't want to have sex with me, so I went out in the evenings with a guy from work, said Annie. Tom found out. I hurt him badly, even though nothing actually happened to that guy. A little kissing and touching. You know, that kind of college stuff. At least it got us talking. And we actually talked for the first time about why Tom doesn't want kids. I think this is the reason why we are still going through difficulties. I mean this affair. I can see how difficult this would be for Tom, Denise said. You know, I always thought that I was a one-man woman, and I was like that our whole marriage. Denise continued, but now it doesn't seem so important to me. I mean, what's the point, right? At the end of the day, marriage is still difficult, and I still have to endure it. And what's wrong with being happy? I just don't think it's a big deal if I have a little fun. It doesn't actually harm anyone. Denise said again. I didn't like where this conversation was going. I was actually quite scared. Really just sad and disappointed. Although our marriage was difficult, I truly felt that I truly loved Denise. But somehow I always felt that this was not so on her part. I mean for a long time I talked to my therapist about these being my childhood insecurities. But listening to her comments, I got that same feeling in my stomach. You know, not a good one. You cheated on Elliot, because if you do, let me tell you, it will tear you apart if you don't want it. I do not know what I want. I know that I want to be happy, and I know that I'm not happy now. I look at Elliot and see my failures, or at least a reminder of them. He once suggested that I would have divorced him by now if I could support myself financially. I didn't object. I didn't say anything at all. Denise said, and no, I haven't cheated on Elliot yet physically. What do you mean? At that moment, Annie's phone rang and she answered. It was her husband. She said that she had to go and that they should continue this conversation later. My wife went back to work and I turned off the camera. By then I was feeling pretty bad. What did she mean when she said more about cheating? And what do you mean not physically? The only thing that came to my mind was that she felt something for this guy. I didn't expect this. I really didn't know what to feel. I think I just sat there in the chair until Denise came into the house. She asked if everything was okay, to which I simply replied no, without explanation. I went to bed without saying a word. Inside I was grieving. I mourned our relationship. I mean, you can't live more than half your life with someone and not feel something for them love friendship, whatever. Grief and fear is all I can describe how I felt. I think it was the realization that I knew where this was going. This is what was going to happen, I feared the most. It's like the analogy people make of watching a train crash in slow motion, unable to stop it. You know what the end result will be, but you just hope and pray that it won't be that way. Now I've never seen a train wreck, and probably a very small percentage of the population have either but it's an easy visual analogy to imagine, minus its reused reference. So, back to today, I walked into her office and saw her designer acting strangely towards me. I was confused. I spent the next few days gathering my thoughts and composure. Every night I had to endure Denise's compliments about Jared's existence and how wonderful he was and how he did everything right. I once commented that she talks about Jared a lot. I asked if she was in love with him. Her eyes showed panic for a moment, but she calmed down and recovered. No, no, I'm just very impressed. The last guy we had was so inexperienced. It's nice when someone takes responsibility. Exactly. I wonder if it was a Freudian slip or if she didn't really mean what she meant under the circumstances. This week was her birthday. 
We had the usual celebration, and the girls gave their mother gifts. I wrote her a letter. This was the letter she asked for as soon as she found out I was writing it. You see, this is part of my suicide letter. It's chilling, I know. What I mean is that we recently finalized our wills, and part of that process was for me to write Denise and each of the girls a goodbye letter. I wanted to tell them what they meant to me, help them cope with their grief, and remember the good times we had. I told Denise about this. She was sad one morning that if she died first, she would never read my letter. I then told her that I would finish the part about our early memories and give it to her. That's what I did. As a result, the letter was 16 pages long, small print, no double spacing. It was a sequential list of paragraphs, each describing a different memory of our time together. I could have written 100 pages, but felt that 16 would be enough for her for now. I gave her this letter for her birthday. She said she wanted to rest so she could read it. Three weeks have passed. She still hasn't opened it. I don't know about you, but if my spouse gave me a 16-page letter full of romantic and good memories, I would want to read it. It showed me where I was for her. It was painful. I knew she was afraid to read it, but that knowledge did not lessen the pain. Denise had a meeting that evening this week, and I figured Jared and another co-worker would be there. I decided that I would go there unexpectedly and unnoticed, and see what happened. Perhaps nothing. I knew she would be driving to a meeting, so I put my iPhone in her car and set it to record audio. I wanted to know what she was talking about with him. I'm not proud of it, but I have become a little desperate in search of the truth. The night of the meeting didn't turn out the way I planned, and I didn't get to go and see with my own eyes what did or didn't happen between Jared and Denise. But I got the recording. I wish I didn't receive it. God, how I wish I didn't have to do this. It was probably the most painful and humiliating 15 minutes of my life. This wasn't just flirting. By the time they returned to the office parking lot, the conversation had become obscenely intimate. I sat and listened. I was listening to the recording downstairs while my wife was upstairs, having just kissed me goodnight. I listened to them kissing. I don't think they actually had sex. It stopped right away when my wife said something like, not right. My guess is that she didn't want to have sex in her car in the office parking lot like some prostitute, while her husband was home taking care of the kids and dinner. At least that's how I explained it to myself. I just sat there frozen. I have never felt such pain. That night I drank myself into oblivion and fell asleep on the couch. Denise woke me up saying it was time to go to work. She asked what was wrong and if I was feeling okay. I didn't really respond, and she shrugged and went about her business. While she was in the shower, her phone beeped. One of those calendar reminder alarms or a new message alarm. I took it. On iPhone, you can set the message to simply appear and the tone to repeat until you respond. The message was from an unknown number. It simply read, Can I see you at the office tonight at 8? I keep thinking about last night. I put my phone back and started getting ready for the day. Denise got dressed, and before leaving the house, she mentioned that she had a meeting at 8 that evening which she forgot to tell me about. Certainly. She said the meeting would be at the town hall, so I shouldn't try to contact her. She should be home by 10. Certainly. I was surprised how easily she lied to me, looking into my eyes. Did I really know this woman? Did what she said actually matter? I decided that I would confront her that night. I'll get to the office maybe at 8.30 and visit them. I didn't really plan what I would do or say. Maybe I can stop this before it really starts and try couples therapy again, I thought. With a different therapist, of course. I was just on autopilot for most of that day. I put on a bright plaid shirt. A lot of people commented on it. My office wife asked if I was feeling okay. She knew the secret of bright shirts. One thing I didn't expect was the amount of pain I felt. I really couldn't breathe or function at all. Painkiller is the word I'm looking for. My wife called after dinner to remind me of her appointment that night. I think she felt something was wrong. Elliot, are you feeling okay? Have you not been yourself and looked very ill this morning? Do you need to go to the doctor? Maybe, I played. 
You know the doctor's office hours are late, so maybe you could take me there to his office this evening. He works in the evening. I was talking about my therapist. Oh, you know I have a meeting tonight? Oh, right. Her only concern was that it wouldn't affect her evening meeting with her friend. What is it? Are you sick? No, not at all. The doctor could help. I was talking about my psychiatrist, not my therapist. She didn't know this. I just found out something terrible about a very good friend of mine, so I'm not feeling very good. It hurts because I don't want anything to do with him anymore, and I might have to tell him tonight if things don't work out. Oh no, let's talk about this tonight after I get back. Fine. Certainly. Okay, bye. And Denise, I love you. I love you too, Elliot. I hope you feel better. I locked my office door. I sat down in a chair and just lounged. I had muscle relaxers in my drawer for anxiety and such for when needed during the day. I also had alcohol. I also had Tylenol with codeine that I was going to take home for my daughter who just had her teeth pulled. I knew I could take enough to cause liver failure and other problems. Oh, believe me, I've researched it. But perhaps the other night was a fluke. This couldn't be the case because today's meeting was a scheduled meeting. I realized that she was deliberately planning to cheat on me. Although maybe not, maybe she was going to tell him that it was a mistake and it needed to stop. Maybe the train wreck won't be as bad as I know it will be. Right. People see what they choose to see. I sat there and seriously thought about taking all the medications and the entire bottle of vodka. The only thing that stopped me was the thought of my girls. It wouldn't be fair, really, if my office wife found me like that. It would be too traumatic. It wouldn't be fair. In addition, girls will not receive any insurance payments. I left the office at 6 o'clock and went home. I picked up dinner and went home to feed the girls. I existed in a state of shock until 8, at which time I told my daughters that I needed to get things done. I kissed them both and told them I loved them and how much they meant to me. I told them that one day they would receive a letter letting them know how important they were to me, but I hoped it wouldn't be any time soon. They really didn't understand what I was talking about. I got ready and went to Denise's office. As I stood outside, I felt empty, scared, and strangely hopeful that everything would be okay. As I stood outside trying to listen, I wondered how I ended up in this place and time. The office had a large window at the front with a door. The blinds were closed and the small office faced the sidewalk. There was another door on the side of the building. I stood outside. I turned on my iPhone and went to the web server to see what was going on under the hood. I wish I had done this. God, I'm so sorry I did this. I'm not going to go into detail about what I saw and heard. These were things that a married man should never see or hear about his wife. Did I really know this woman? Who the hell was she? Or who did she become? The train wreck didn't stop. It was getting worse. I thought about stopping it and intervening. But I didn't do it. Not because he was a coward, but because he felt it was over and somehow accepted it. It hurt like it did, but I couldn't control what she did. It took more strength not to go in than to go in and face them. We don't really own the other person, so I couldn't tell her what to do. It's more like we share parts of our lives through mutual respect. How to share your soul. Share your hopes and fears. Share laughter. You're fooling yourself if you think otherwise. I was about to turn off the phone when I heard my wife asking him to stop. They haven't had sex yet. They had a fight. Jared rushed out the front door but didn't notice me from the side. He got into the car and quickly drove away. My wife was crying in the office. Usually it becomes very unpleasant for me to see her cry. Not this time. The front door was open, so I entered. This nearly gave her a heart attack, and she exclaimed, Elliot, what are you doing here? She looked scared. How long are you here? All the time. I was drained, as if it didn't matter anymore. I was about to go in and stop him when I heard a crash. Oh God, Elliot, I'm so sorry. So, so sorry. She began to sob. I don't know what the hell I was doing, and when I realized it, I told him to stop. Certainly. 
I wish she had stopped sooner before destroying our marriage. She cried, almost out of control, saying meaningless things, mostly about how badly she screwed up and how she never realized how much she loved me. Denise, I have to go. I will have documents for you to sign in the morning. I prepared them today in case this happens tonight. I said this to hurt her. I was angry, of course. In fact, I didn't have any documents. What the hell do you mean, Elliot? Why can't I go home? What documents? Sorry, but let me explain. I... What do you mean if it happens tonight? How did you know? Shut up, Denise. I mean, does it really matter now? Is this really the question you want to ask me after what you did? You damn. I really wanted to call her names, but that's not in my nature. She was the mother of my children and everything. That never stopped her from calling me names. Like when she called me an asshole in front of our girls. That fight started because I wanted to spend time with her and asked for an evening together. You can't come home because if you do. I didn't finish and I didn't have to. Her eyes flashed with fear and confusion as she stepped back. You see, I was holding my own for now, but inside I felt pure, unadulterated rage over the death of my marriage. Do not come to me. I was really very scared. I was really afraid that I wouldn't be able to hold it in, and I really didn't want to hurt her. I used to love her. She was the mother of my children. Denise came to me, crying, sobbing, shaking. She tried to cuddle up to me, all the while exclaiming how much she loves me and asking for forgiveness. I started to panic, mostly out of fear of losing control and hurting her, so I started backing away and trying to push her away. Leave me alone, I was upset at this moment. I was stepping back, and at that moment, as fate would have it, I tripped over the curb of the sidewalk. The city should really get around to fixing these things. Denise was on the city commission on these issues, for goodness sake, so it would seem that the sidewalks should be safe. I didn't mention that her office was near the street corner. Not that it would matter if. About the time I tripped, the blue Fiat turned the corner. In fact, it would be more accurate to say that he turned the corner at speed. It was some high school student trying to get his girlfriend home before curfew, rushing along, not paying attention. So my Labrador, whom I told you about earlier, died. Some high school student was in a hurry to take his girlfriend home so she wouldn't be late and hit her. Her name was Lady. She had coarse black fur. She was a mother. The driver probably didn't see her because of the black color, but if he had slowed down, he would have seen her. He broke her back. She never saw it. My best friend of seven years died because the girl would be late and get into trouble. She died because my father blinded her, preventing her from reacting in time and avoiding danger. A blue car hit me. At that moment everything became like in slow motion. So slow. I was gone in a split second. Forty years and the switch was turned off. Someone called an ambulance. My wife rushed to me, crying hysterically. Maybe the girls will still receive insurance payments. Tracy will finally read that letter. I heard voices coming and going. I heard from my wife and my daughters. I heard my sister and my brothers. I wondered why everyone was here and why couldn't I move. It was like waking up in the middle of the night and not being able to move your arms or legs. Everything was black and my eyes couldn't open. I heard my wife talking for a long time. She said something about how she was sorry and asking God to give her another chance. She promised to be there for me and the girls. She promised a lot of things that I didn't fully hear. I was plunged into darkness again. I woke up from a bright light. I tried to move, but I felt severe pain throughout my body. I tried to speak, but I had tubes in my throat. An alarm sounded somewhere nearby. What the hell is going on? Are you awake? We thought you would return to us soon. Do not move. I'll call your wife and daughters if they're still here. Don't try to talk. Please lie still. She was wearing white. After a while, my wife came in alone. Hello, dear. I'm so happy you woke up. She cried while saying this. Don't talk. They'll give you something for the pain, and it might put you to sleep again. You were in a terrible accident, and I'm afraid it's all my fault. Are you in the hospital? I'll stay here with you. 
I love you so much. I will never leave you, I promise. I fell asleep again. This went on for a long time. I found out later that I was in a coma for about two weeks before I woke up for the first time. The doctors put me into an induced coma due to a severe head injury. The doctor said I might never remember what happened. At first I didn't really remember what happened, or any of it. But after a while the memory began to return a little. Although no one talked to me about what happened that night other than the accident itself, Denise apologized numerous times, and I kept asking her what she was apologizing for. Denise kept trying to explain what happened, and I just kept saying I didn't want to talk about it yet. A few weeks after I left the hospital, I actually remembered everything that happened. I just didn't tell anyone, although I suspect Denise guessed it. You see, I choose to see what I want to see. I know this may not make sense to some of you. Let me explain. What I saw was a wife who was deeply lost and found her way back. I saw a wife who was repentant and betrayed. I saw a woman confused by her choices, good and bad, and trying to free herself from their consequences. I saw myself before the accident, and believe me, I didn't really like myself. I saw myself now, or maybe the me I wanted to become. I have seen. No, that's wrong. I felt love. Sometimes love is a choice. It took me a while to figure this out. About 40 years, actually, and I still don't fully understand. And before you think I chickened out and never confronted my wife about what happened with her short affair or got any closure or went all Caucasian on her ass, don't do it. The last time I encountered her, it literally killed me. And I wasn't going to do it again. So when it actually happened, I mean I confronted her, it had to be on my own terms when I am ready. I realized one important thing. I realized that all this was not about me. It was about her. It was about her insecurities, her character weaknesses, her elections, her wishes, her needs, her regrets, her fears, and her failures. I can thank my psychiatrist for this part of the insight too, knowing this didn't make it any easier for me, but it helped. When part of your soul hurts, everything hurts. She has been a part of my soul for better and for worse. Some time after the accident, I actually spoke to her after I had recovered. We started the discussion slowly, but progressed to saying all the things we should have said in couples therapy or throughout our marriage, but for whatever reason didn't. There were all the expected heartfelt apologies and regrets and promises made from her and also from me. I asked her to forgive me. For what? For not being the man she needed and causing her to go looking for what she was missing. Being a suicidal husband was not the man she needed. I know you think it was weakness or an attempt to let it all go and blame myself, like I did when I was little. This is wrong. Taking responsibility for your part, no matter how small, takes real strength. And this responsibility is what it means to be a man, a husband, a father. My father never understood this until he died never asked for forgiveness, and never took responsibility. Never. I'm not my father, and he damaged me enough with all his crap before and after he died. True strength is accepting this responsibility, and not throwing her ass out on the street, and listening. It means allowing your wife to vent to you and blame you for things, knowing that what she really needed was someone to tell her everything would be okay, that her feelings of frustration were valid. This means allowing her to voice her problems and trusting that someone is there to lean on. I mean, I really gave it to her at the altar, after all. I left her alone to cope on her own during those years of my depression. Yes, you heard correctly, I said years. For many years I left my wife alone to deal with everything on her own, because I couldn't. For this I asked her forgiveness. She also asked for forgiveness, and I forgave her. What really mattered to me was what we said. I mean, we really talked about what each of us needed and, most importantly, our fears. We discussed why we were so lost and how we needed to find our way back to ourselves and each other. We finally allowed ourselves to be vulnerable. Her fear was of letting me down. I think it's really about letting yourself down. Remnant from childhood. My fear was simply being alone, or more accurately, being abandoned, unloved. Again, childhood trauma. 
You know, I had never felt so close to her until we started this long series of conversations. I must say that since then I have felt this constantly. It's just a pity that it took such an accident for us to understand what is truly important in our lives. It's funny how it works. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one.